Um, so welcome everyone to the Drug and Alcohol Research uh, and Innovation Active Learning Network, DARIA. Um, we are lucky enough today to have our one of our emergency medicine registrars from St. Vincent's, uh, Dr. Eleanor McLaren, who is currently doing her uh, term uh, with us in the drug and alcohol team. Uh, I'd like to firstly give a big thank to uh, Ellie for jumping in. We had a different person, um, different presentation plan for this week and they had to cancel at about a week's notice. So Ellie has very kindly jumped in at the last minute to do the journal club, which we are all very grateful for. So please be kind in your questions, comments, and feedback. Uh, but I um, believe that she's going to look at a paper that was in the Lancet, <clears throat> small little journal you may have all heard of, um, that was looking at uh, opioids and opioid-free analgesia after surgical discharge which I thought um, would have some relevance um, as we know that there is uh, around about a 10% um, a rate of people um, developing dependence when they are started on opioids after leaving hospital. But I'm sure Ellie will tell us more about all of that. So without any further ado, please take it away. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, so as Chris said, uh, I'm Ellie, for anyone who doesn't know me. Um, I'm one of the emergency medicine registrars here at Binney's and currently on my drug and alcohol rotation. So at the moment, I'm the registrar down in the Gorman unit, so the inpatient detox unit. Um, I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people um, of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. So um, today I'm going to enlighten you with a Canadian study, as Chris said, is published in The Lancet earlier this year. Um, it was a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized trials, looking at opioid versus opioid-free analgesia after surgical discharge. So why is this important? Um, excessive opioid prescribing has contributed to a devastating crisis of addiction, particularly in North America. Around 10.1 million Americans misused opioids in the past year. Um, in 2020, an average of 44 people died each day from overdoses uh, involving prescription opioids, totaling more than 16,000 deaths. Uh, prescription opioids were involved in nearly 18% of all opioid overdose deaths in 2020, with a 16% increase in uh, prescription opioid involved death rates from 2019 to 2020. However, this problem is by no means limited to America. The UN launched a five pillar integrated response to the global opioid crisis crisis, mainly affecting North America with fentanyl and its analogues, and parts of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East with tramadol. Um, there's a distinct lack of data available from African and Asian continents. Uh, just recently, they've done, I say recently, 2018, they did the first ever drug survey in Nigeria, um, which found that 4.6 million people had abused the use of uh, opioids like tramadol. Uh, for non-medical reasons. It's very cheap to buy tablets of tramadol in Nigeria. Uh, they're about sort of 35 cents uh, in Aussie dollars. Um, and it's often used by young males to improve sexual function. So acute pain is sort of universal with uh, after surgery. Opioids have been the mainstay of post-operative analgesia but the current best practice does emphasize uh, a multimodal opioid sparing regimen based on a background of paracetamol, uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory anti and an opioid. Opioids are frequently overused and particularly after hospital discharge. Uh, surgeons are responsible for the second highest rates of opioid prescribing among medical specialties. So I think primarily it's primary care, physicians, uh, and then it's of the medical specialties, pain specialists and surgeons. Although the prescriptions are, are well intended to reduce post-operative pain and discomfort, the studies have shown that even minor surgeries can be 
uh, initial events for patients who are opioid naive to become persistent users. Even patients who do not go on to become persistent users uh, may also contribute to this opioid crisis uh, by diverting unused tablets for non-medical use by others. So it's been reported that up to 70% of opioids prescribed to surgical patients go unused. Um, a little side note just for uh, us here in Australia. So pharmaceutical opioids are now responsible for more deaths and poisoning hospitalizations than illegal opioids such as heroin. In 2019, there were 1,644 unintentional deaths due to drug overdose in Australia. Um, so about 26% of these deaths were due to pharmaceutical opioids. In a scoping review of the literature, only eight randomized control trials ident were identified as comparing an opioid versus an opioid free regimen after surgical discharge. None of those identified synthesized evidence to inform prescribing practice. So given this scenario, evidence-based strategies are required to support judicious opioid prescribing while ensuring patients still have effective pain management. Because of the scarcity of conclusive evidence, the decision to prescribe opioids versus non-opioids um, often comes down to clinician preference, habit, or their healthcare culture. So the research question. Uh, in patients discharged after undergoing a surgical procedure, to what extent does the prescription of opioids in comparison to opioid-free analgesia affects self-reported pain intensity and adverse events. So this was a predefined PICO question, so broken down into your population, so those discharged after undergoing a surgical procedure. This was defined according to the World Health Organization definition, which is any procedure involving the incision, excision, or suturing of tissue requiring regional or general or sedation. Um, and involving patients who are over the age of 15. The intervention was looking at opioid an opioid analgesia regimen post surgical procedure with the comparison of an opioid free regime. Uh, and the primary outcome was self reported pain intensity on the first day after surgical discharge. So the study design, it was a systematic review plus uh, meta-analysis looking over a 30 year time period. So from January the 1st, 1990 to July the 8th, 2021. Um, and my understanding is that they chose, like limited it at that time frame because of changes in non-invasive surgical practices from around then. Um, they included random control trials of uh, parallel design, which enrolled young people, uh, adults uh, aged over 15, who'd been discharged after undergoing a surgical procedure, and compared an analgesia regimen after discharge, including opioids versus op opioid-free analgesia, and included a multiple dose design focused on the overall effect of repeated doses um, of the analgesia prescribed. The trials targeted both elective and emergency procedures. For their exclusion, they excluded trials that were single dose as they felt didn't reflect real world practice and where uh, analgesia regimens uh, obviously would normally span several days post-operatively. They excluded placebo controlled trials where no active analgesia drugs were offered to patients and studies where post-operative analgesia regimens were not clearly described. Uh, they also excluded studies that exclusively focused on children, studies with post-discharge analgesia administrated via invasive routes, such as intravenous or epidural, which obviously isn't very commonly done anyway, uh, and studies evaluating analgesia for chronic post-operative pain which they defined as treatment starting beyond two months post-surgery. Um, so how they defined the opioid and the opioid-free analgesia is quite important. So for opioid analgesia, they defined it as any pain management regimen after discharge involving the use of drugs that act on 
opioid receptors. Um, but the opioid free was defined as any pain management regimen, pharmacological, non-pharmacological, or combined, as a pretty broad spectrum, that does not include opioid drugs. However, despite that last phrase, the trials in which opioids were offered to opioid-free groups were included, but only if the drugs were not ready, readily available. So they included trials where patients could be given opioids as sort of a rescue uh, line of analgesia, but as long as it required contact with a healthcare provider to get a new prescription. Um, so there's a bit of ambiguity there. The primary outcomes of interest, uh, the first primary outcome was self-reported pain intensity on the first day after surgical discharge. So they took the latest assessment recorded between uh, 13 hours and 24 hours post-discharge because um, to try and sort of make allowances for the effect of analgesic interventions using uh, used during the surgery to have worn off. And the co-primary outcome was the risk of post-operative vomiting, uh, which they looked at for up to a 30-day period post-operatively. Uh, they chose these two as their primary outcomes because uh, the literature review had identified the most desirable outcome to be well-controlled analgesia and the least desirable outcome to be post-operative vomiting. As per previous recommendations, they prioritised reports of dynamic pain over pain at rest um, and the worst pain over average pain. If data was available, they were uh, looking to assess other endpoints recommended in core outcomes for perioperative care, which included pain intensity at other time points. So from day zero, and then the latest assessment recorded between six hours, 12 hours, and up to 30 days. They also were interested in drug adverse events other than vomiting, pain interference, patient dissatisfaction with pain management, and uh, participant disposition. So things like withdrawal because of adverse events or ineffective treatment, self-reported health status, and healthcare reutilization i.e. having to return back to hospital or clinic. Um, and they'd also expressed an interest in post-operative rates of prolonged opioid use, misuse and dependence. Um, randomized controlled trials identified to um, inform this in protocols and registries and conference proceeding, uh, authors were contacted up to three times by email to try and provide the study and outcome data required. So the methods used. The search strategy followed the preferred uh, reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. They searched Medline, Embase, the Cochrane Library, Scopus, AMED, Biosis, and Sinal. Um, and the search strategies were all developed by a medical librarian and then peer-reviewed. The extraction of data was done independently and in duplicate by pairs of reviewers. Disagreements were resolved by consensus or by consulting an adjudicator. The, for the risk of bias, an assessment was done independently and in duplicate with two investigators using the Cochrane's risk of bias tool 2.0. Uh, which addresses five domains, so comprising randomization process, deviations from intended interventions, um, missing outcome data, outcome measurements, and selective reporting. For the data analysis, data uh, were pooled using random effect models and weighted mean differences and 95% confidence intervals were calculated for pain intensity and some of the other continuous uh, outcomes. They then used forest plots to display the meta-analysis findings. Uh, the analysis was all done using Starter and comparisons were two-tailed and statistical significance was based on a 95% confidence interval, excluding the null. They also used predefined subgroup analysis and post hoc sensitivity analysis. So it was very comprehensive. 
funding was by the Canadian Institute of Health Research, um, but the funder of the study had no role in the design, data collection, analysis, or publication of the report. So the results. Um, oh, sorry, no, the subgroup analysis. For predefined subgroup analysis, they looked at the heterogeneity between uh, randomized control trials, uh, which was assessed using the I squared test. So to explore for potential sources of heterogeneity in the analysis of the co-primary outcomes, they did subgroup analyses if there were two or more trials in each group. They tested hypotheses that uh, larger opioid effect sizes would be observed in trials involving the following characteristics. So those where surgeries were done in an outpatient clinic versus in a hospital operating room, minor versus major surgery, um, day surgery versus inpatient surgery, so there had to be at least one overnight stay, uh, those with only women as participants, because of reports of uh, sex-specific data or sex-specific surgeries, such as your gynecological or your breast surgery, um, versus those for men or both sexes, uh, and also would, between trials with high versus lower risk of bias. Um, so of the 23,977 articles, 567 underwent full text review. 47 uh, of these trials met eligibility criteria. So that meant your N meant N equals 6,607 patients. 25 of these trials were North American and 11 European. 64% uh, of trials involved elective minor procedures. So that was about 63% dental procedures. Uh, and then 36% of trials involved procedures of moderate extent. Uh, so of those, about 47% was orthopedic and 30% was general surgical procedures. Those that then, uh, yeah, so then compared with opioid-free analgesia, opioid prescribing did not reduce pain on the first day after discharge. So that was their primary outcome finding. However, the weighted mean difference of 0.01 centimeter with a uh, confidence, a 95% confidence interval, of uh, minus 0.26 to 0.27, defined as moderate certainty, but sort of borderline significance, um, or at any other post-operative time point, gave moderate to very low certainty. Opioid prescribing was associated with increased risk of vomiting. So the relative risk was 4.5, a 95% confidence interval of 1.93 to 10.51, so very high certainty. Um, and other adverse events, including nausea, constipation, dizziness, and drowsiness, gave a high to moderate uh, certainty. Um, opioids were not found to affect any other outcomes. So the overall mean difference, the 95% confidence interval of 0.01, uh, it's sort of just on the borderline of significant, but what's quite interesting with this data is that the overall I squared value is 71.4%, which means that there was a sort of very high level of heterogeneity um, in these studies, which begs the question, should they really have all been grouped together? Um, like, are they similar enough to have been used? So the strengths, there are a lot of strengths to this study. It's the first systematic review to synthesize evidence on comparative effectiveness of opioid versus opioid free analgesia, specifically after post operative discharge. And um, it addresses a major knowledge gap that hinders the use of evidence based prescribing as a strategy to mitigate uh, post operative opioid related harms. They use very robust statistical methods to meta analyze data from RCTs, um, but these methods were obviously not free from limitations when the outcome reporting was so heterogeneous. Um, the quality and strength of the evidence is also evaluated with the Cochrane uh, Collaborations Risk of Bias tool and with the GRADE framework. So everything they've done, uh, they've done very well. 
the limitations, uh, evidence for this trial, uh, evidence for the study relied on trials focused on elective surgeries, predominantly of minor or moderate extent, which does suggest that clinicians can consider prescribing opioid-free analgesia in only these surgical settings. Um, nothing, uh, no trials investigated opioid-free analgesia after major or major complex surgery. So things like uh, lung bowel resections or multi-organ resection for your complex procedures. The study compared a relatively standardized opioid regimen because of standard practice uh, to a widely varying uh, regimen of opioid free analgesia, the fact that it included pharmaceutical, non-pharmaceutical and uh, combined approaches. And it also had a very limited focus on the potential adverse events of uh, opioid-free regimens. So with things like your non-steroidals, GI bleeds or platelet dys dysfunction, but it didn't look at those at all. It was purely the adverse outcomes of um, opioids. And in addition, the data was largely derived from trials with very high risk of bias. Um, so given these limitations, it's obvious that there's a need to kind of advance the, the quality of scope of research in this field. So some recommendations um, to sort of go through the data and try and group similar studies and improve the I squared value. Um, I think it's supposed to be closer to 50 rather than sort of 70. So to try and improve the heterogeneity of the data and improve your confidence in it. Um, further exploring the data to synthesize evidence for different types of non-opioid regimens specifically. So you could break it down into your pharmaceutical, non-pharmaceutical or combined so that you can have comparisons of them individually, because I think that's a very broad spectrum to have, have lumped under one brush. Um, use a standardized non-opioid regimen appropriate for each level of surgical complexity because the range of being from a dental extraction to you know having an appendix removed um you need very very different uh, levels of analgesia so i think looking specifically at each level of complexity or even the speciality of surgery being dental orthopedic um to give you sort of more clinically relevant data um, taking a look at the longer term outcomes with a focus on misuse and chronic pain, uh, as well as the specific population risk factors for both of those. Um, it was expressed as an interest that there's actually no outcome data provided. So I don't know whether that's just because they weren't able to identify any. It says that people were emailed and they'd ask for more, but there's actually no opioid misuse um, outcome information. And then I think this is a really important point, expand the study to analyze data between countries with similar prescribing practices. So this study identified predominantly American data. It's, it's where most of the data comes from globally. Um, but I think in this instance, it really limits the generalizability of uh, the evidence given there's such a stark difference in prescribing practice. Um, there was a study that focused on different uh, nations prescribing patterns after discharge following surgery, and it found that opioids were prescribed to 95% of patients undergoing surgery in the US, compared to only 5% in European, Asian, South American and Middle Eastern countries. Um, so is it that practice that's sort of skewing the data? And maybe for countries, you know, uh, would a regulated opioid prescribing regimens such as we would have here in Australia uh, be better than an opioid free alternative. So will this change your practice? Um, I think ultimately the answer is probably no, but it's a very good starting point. Um, the study definitely has potential to contribute to practice changing evidence and potentially inform future guidelines. Um, to help improve opioid prescribing and mitigate opioid related harm. The main conclusions I've drawn from it are that, um, firstly, it was a very good methodology of a systematic review and meta-analyses. 
but their main issue is that the output is only ever going to be as good as the input. So published literature on the prevalence of prescription opioid consumption is very incomplete, delayed and historical data, which really limits the ability of uh, clinicians and policymakers to provide an evidence based guidance for opioid use. So as they'd highlighted, you definitely need further uh, robust RCTs. Um, but from the evidence that they have found, you can definitely inform your patients that non-opioid uh, regimens would reduce post-op vomiting. Um, so although there's not much you could take away clinically, um, above everything, it's, I hope it has at least increased awareness of your responsibility to your patients to do no harm and to prescribe responsibly. Uh, I think the key to the opioid crisis is going to be education, particularly with harm reduction. Um, with prescription medications, particularly, there's a public perception that they're safe because they've been prescribed um, and they are readily available. In my own experience in ED, people can be very dismissive of taking simple analgesia, so just your um, paracetamol and ibuprofen. People have often just you know, taken a single dose and said it hasn't worked, uh, don't take it regularly. Uh, you, I'm constantly explaining the need for sort of a baseline simple analgesia and that you'll add things to it. Um, but it's not just the patients that need educating. Um, I think most clinicians are aware that opioids should be used with caution, but I think uh, there's a limited understanding of which patient populations are at risk of dependence. So I think um, an open conversation about that uh, will allow for sort of informed decision making and a collaborative approach to analgesia. There's a few little tools, I'm sure most of you are already aware of them, but just um, in case you aren't. So SafeScript has recently come to New South Wales. Um, it allows prescribers and pharmacists to review prescribing and dispensing history for monitored medicines. Uh, so it can help you to identify patients who are at risk, potentially if they've got multiple prescribers, um, all the types of medications that are being prescribed. And uh, the New South Wales Agency for Clinical Innovation has got a validated self-report screening tool. I think it's primarily designed for patients in a primary care setting, um, but it's a very good way to kind of start the conversation. Um, and of course, the lovely Heath Ledger. We can't talk about opioids without him. So yeah, if anyone's got any questions. Thank you very much, Ellie. And uh, lovely to have that analysis of the paper um, and also a bit of discussion about the wider context. And of course, uh, assessing their methodology um, and which <clears throat> sounds like you felt their methodology was at least sound. It's one of those, um, you know, you put the proverbial in and you get the proverbial out uh, type situations. Um, I have a couple of thoughts, but before I share them, uh, I might just ask people to please put questions, uh, comments. I think this is whilst obviously, you know, we as in the world of addiction and, and so forth, uh, often, you know, this is, it's, it's often, this is perhaps not one could say this is not as relevant for us is because we're not you know surgical residents and registrars uh that are that are prescribing or you know the junior doctors that are on the ward but i feel still think there's a lot of relevance here and people do sometimes ask our opinion on whether to to you know have patients you know what, what they should have when on discharge and um i i i i hear your cynicism about uh the paper a couple of thoughts on that. One is, uh, I imagine there's a lot of people who don't want, <laughs> don't want to do study. Um, there's a lot of people invested in. Uh, I mean, you know, unfortunately, much research is uh, done. You know, is 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 funded by, uh, you know, pharmaceutical industries themselves. So they're hardly going to uh, want to fund studies that are telling you to prescribe less of their medications. And that's not a big a big pharma. That's just the world. Um, I, I, 
I mean, I, I have to say I wasn't entirely, I, I, I wasn't, I mean, I feel like you were underwhelmed by the study and I, I wasn't. And I do wonder if, if really for, at least for elective and day procedures, and, I, and I've, I've had them myself and I've gone home with packets of endone and, and uh, panadine fort. Um, I mean, should, should, should we just, you know, the day, put it this way, the, the day procedures, should we just be saying no? I definitely think there's an argument for it. Um, but I think the issue comes that there's no clear guidance on the alternative. And I think there doesn't necessarily have to be an alternative. Um, most people would probably manage perfectly fine on uh, Panadol and, and ibuprofen, but um, I think until there's you know clear non-opioid guidance, people will really struggle to not just give that you know that safety net of like oh we'll take this you don't have to use it, and I think we need to move away from that because that's ultimately the the risky and irresponsible mm -hmm. uh, prescription. It's very, it's very hard to, yes, uh, and and I've, I've, you know, been through that myself as a as a junior, and it is very challenging as a junior. You've got a patient there saying, "Well, what if things get worse? And what am I going to take when I get there?" And I've been on this, and now you're going to stop it, doctor. Uh, it it is extremely challenging. Um, another thing that's been floated has been the notion of a. So we have. Uh, antibiotic, uh, antimicrobial stewardship in hospitals? Do we need opioid stewardship within hospitals? I mean, there's two sides to that. Like it's probably a good idea and a lot of good could come from it, but it also then starts to go the other way and you're taking away kind of clinician autonomy and knowing their patients and making an informed decision which the majority of people would do well and take everything into account and I think if you're then having to explain your decision making or get audited on it or questioned on it and have to explain it is that going to make people make decisions that are less about the patient and more about what level of paperwork they want to do. Shouldn't clinicians cause this mess? Um, yes, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's difficult and a lot of you know, the opioids are, themselves are being villainized probably more than the responsible use of them. Um, so I um, think, yeah, sorry, no, no, I just think it's challenging to kind of split the two especially when the majority of the data is coming from America where they're not being used responsibly. You literally get paid per the, the volume that you prescribe. So the incentive is totally different, which is why I do think they, a lot of data could come from this study if they look specifically at you know, countries with a regulated um, prescribing or monitored prescribing, because then you can really kind of tease out what's the opioids and what's, you know, you might be able to get a better idea of what's the prescribing and what's the actual drug. No, I agree. I think, I think it's, it's very hard to translate um, particularly American studies in, 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 into this, just given how um, unregulated it all was. Um, particularly in, in those states without the, um, uh, people will have to forgive me, the triple carbon pharmacy pads, grip pads, those were the states that did well versus the ones without the um, triple, basically this was a, there's some good evidence suggesting that those states where there was, cut, where there had to be carbon copies and, and mail them all off and basically make it all a big pain in the bum for doctors to prescribe opioids those had uh, much lower levels of opioid prescribing than the other ones. And again, I wonder if something, if something like that could apply here. So, you know, um, put the onus onto the doctors. Okay, if you want to send your patients home with opioids, you can do it. It's just going to need this bit of paperwork. Um, and, you know, that might, you know, some doctors will do it. Many will kick up a stink, but I do wonder if that's a potential 
way around this issue. Yeah. Um, you mentioned heterogeneity there. Um, my understanding is uh, that you want it down at about 25%. So okay. I don't know if that's right. And perhaps some of the... I knew it was like below 50, but... I... Yeah, I think definitely. And perhaps some of... We've got... We do have some researchers online who are better at this than me. Please uh, Looking at you, Krista. Um, so please jump on and tell me if I've got that right. Um, and to other people who, who are, um, just I guess on the question of um, of, of of heterogeneity and, and and methodology, oh um, well, I'll come to my question in a moment. Uh, Rob wanted to ask a question. I don't know if we can. Am I able to? Oh, here we go, Rob. I, you can turn yourself off mute. You've been given power to power to talk. How oh, exciting! Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're, I think you're the first non-panelist to ever to ever get this power. So please, oh, no, goodness. Use, oh. don't use, use it for good, not evil. Oh, no, I, I should have thought this through first. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if we're supposed to be able to chat, but I guess the chat has been disabled. Or I would have just asked it there. Um, I just uh, yeah, firstly, Ellie, that that was great. Thank you. I hadn't seen this paper and like really solid, thorough summary, both of the methodologies, the limitations of the study, but also of the findings. So thank you for that. I, I guess I just wanted to comment, like, yeah, I, I agree. Like, is opioid stewardship in hospitals a, a feasible thing, even if it might be a good thing on paper? Like, maybe not. But I mean, in terms of saying, like, generally, people make good decisions around these things, and we probably do hold a good amount of clinical responsibility. I think a similar thing was said about antibiotics before we had antimicrobial stewardship and then mm. you just saw such dramatic falls in rates of prescribing when they introduced it without increased negative outcomes and I know that um, I think yeah they did sort of a review in 2018 and they found that out of I don't know a survey of only a couple of hundred doctors but I think more than 70 percent of people were prescribing opioids for people just in case even before they'd made a decision about them going home um, so I think yeah that the real concern for me would be just going home decisions rather than necessarily managing people with pain while they're in hospital avoiding those whole uh, yeah just just chucking them in just just in case and and I, I did also note that the um what is it? The Australian Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare is, has actually announced an opioid stewardship um, clinical oh, okay. care standard uh, just in April of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that'd go some way to maybe managing some of these issues, I guess. Yeah, interesting. I didn't know that. Mm. Me yeah. either until just now. <laughs> no, that, that's really interesting, Rob. And look, and I look, I I'm not here to disparage my colleagues, but there's plenty of evidence that suggests we all think we're very good decision makers and just a polite reminder that less than that at least half of doctors are below average uh, when, it, when you think about it um, you know um, but um, also I mean I, I think about there was a study of, of um, asking sort of um junior doctors in america how influenced they are by advertising and so forth and uh 16 said they thought they might be you know influenced by external forces you know big pharma you know being wined and dined all this sort of thing but 63 percent thought their colleagues were likely to be vulnerable to that sort of thing so none of us think that we're like, you know, we all think we're very good decision makers, but we're all a little bit cynical about everybody else's decision making. So therefore, we kind of have to say, well, maybe we're none of us are that good decision making. I don't know. Um, anyway. Uh, but thank you, Rob. That's, um, yeah, that's, 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 that's really great insight. Um, what was I going to say? Um, uh, Krista has kindly uh weighed in thank you krista a heterogeneity to be able to meta analyze uh, should be reasonably low i think 30 to 60 is considered moderate high and high levels ahead of make it difficult yeah and and i think in in a in a uh you know sur surgical surgery in general is a, is a vast vast spectrum you know there's there's you know patients going in from a gastroscopy at one end and colonoscopy you know, to getting, you know, other day procedures all the way up to, you know, complex rib cracking surgery. So there's obviously a huge amount of spectrum in, in the pay, in the operations alone, uh, let alone the patients that you might have in there. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm hardly surprised that in a study like this, that uh, there was, there was that, and I think there'll always be that struggle to, 
to, to get that. Um, please do keep coming in if you and if you do want to raise your hand, we can we can let you chat. Um, the other thing I was just going to just wanted to comment on, you mentioned the opioid um, scoring tool. Um, and and I have seen this around. Does, does do you, I mean, I, it, I, I see what it's saying and I haven't looked into the validation of it. My fear um, is that I guess this is, an, you know, how do I put this? This is, it's, I don't want to say the word stigmatizing, but, you know, then patients, you know, may turn around and say, well, you get, you know, you've given, you would give other patients this, why not me? You know, it's a very, it, it adds another level of judgment, if you will, um, to people with substance dependence. Um, I, probably more a comment than a question, but what did you, how do you, how do you feel about that, Ellie? No, I can see, I can see how it could be perceived like that, but then also a lot of people with, um, you know, substance use disorder or or addiction are very aware of it. And I think almost the openness and the willingness to engage in conversation is only a good thing to kind of reduce stigma. So kind of, I think if you were a GP sat in a room and at least you've got something that they sort of fill out and you're with them and it starts a conversation, even if you've got patients you don't really know much about or you're trying to gauge something about if you've got your sixth sense or your inklings I think it could be a really good tool to start a conversation for the right people um so yeah I think it's something to have in your armory but maybe not appropriate for everyone no look it, it's it's a challenge and I guess if you're going to use such a tool you want to know that that tool itself you know you can answer any questions about it that might come up or any criticisms that might come up from it from your patients because uh, it's one thing to use the tool, but you've also got to be able to, to back up that it's that it's worthwhile and, and everything else at the risk of causing any chagrin. Um, well, I don't think anybody else has got any more questions or comments or anything, and you're probably all sick and tired. I, I, I find this... Oh, sorry, the last thing I was going to ask, do you think this, this paper deserved to be in The Lancet? Um, I do. I initially was okay. very critical of it and was ready to get it removed. I um, did. I did. I, I should have got more everyone here. I ran into uh, Ellie last week and she was tearing it to shreds. And I said, brilliant, we can tear the Lancet apart. Um, but no, I think it's, you know, the first of its kind. It's produced a huge volume of data that they can now sort of pull from. So I think as a starting point, they've done everything really well. They couldn't have done you know, the analysis and the um, uh, data extraction much better than they have done. It's just about how you then interpret it that I think can be tweaked. So I think it's, yeah, it's a good starting point. Someone had to do it. Yeah, no, I, I, I tend to agree. And there'll probably be more sort of, as you say, sort of there might be some more sub-analyses or whatever else that, that come out of it. So, um. Oh well, we have let the Lancet off with a pass on this occasion. Keep <laughs> its uh, its uh, impact factor score intact. Um, well, look uh, again. Um, thank you, Ellie. Um, appreciate um, you jumping in to um, to fill in. Uh, as as I say, we had a um, a last minute um, uh, cancellation last week. So please all uh, join me in, in thanking um, in thanking uh, Dr. Ellie McLaren for um, her wonderful presentation, and hopefully next week we will be joined by a familiar face, uh, which is Dr. Liam Aitchison, um, who we've seen uh, who we've already had already this year, but he's going to be talking about uh, the results of his OLAM study, which was uh, held at. St. Vincent's Hospital, and I, I for one, don't know the results, and I am chomping at the bit. So looking forward to those that next Monday, so please join us then. But in the meantime, thanks again, Ellie. Thank you.